My name is Alex. I'm 44 years old from Miami, Florida. I grew up watching championship wrestling from Florida since the early 80s with my dad, religiously, every Saturday morning. We couldn't afford cable TV, so I would go down the street to my buddy's house to watch Georgia wrestling on the weekends. Long story short, eventually my parents got cable, and I was able to see World Championship Wrestling on TBS, and also during that time, they were showing worldwide wrestling on a local channel. I used to love watching you in the Midnight Express. My dad hated you. Every time you would come on, he would get pissed and go open a beer. He'd come back and you'd, and you'd still be talking. He'll go to the bathroom and take a shit. And he'll come back and you were still on the mic talking and he'd get pissed. So he would go do something in the house or would always tell me to holler when you were off TV unless Dusty or the rock and roll were beating the shit out of you. He loved Dusty. Hell, everybody did. He couldn't stand you. So I, <laughs> so I guess you did what you had to do. I think we've driven that point home that your father was disgusted by the thought of me sharing his fucking oxygen on his planet. Well, let's get to his question here. When you and the Midnight Express were killing it in Crockett in the 80s, did Vince, Vern, or any other promoter try to lure you to them? Well, I... And once again, I I fear sometimes that I'm chewing my food twice because, if, if, of course, I realize that the Midnight Express uh, scrapbook is out of print now and a collector's item. Uh, it was detailed in there. Um, are the people too familiar with when we, we took the trip to talk to Vince in 86? We do know we have a lot of new listeners. <laughs> we got to talk about that at the beginning. It may be a good time well, to revisit. Well, it, what, it, what it happened was uh, – we went to work for Crockett Promotions from World Class in July of 1985, and we had started the program with the Rock and Roll Express uh, in January of 86, and business, as they say, was booming. And it was, God, somewhere around late spring, I guess. I wish I had the Midnight Express scrapbook in front of me, and I would quote the specific times. But the point is, I get a call at the house from Ernie Ladd, who I haven't spoken to um, since we were in Mid-South with him. And Ernie, obviously, in addition to having booked for Bill Watts and been a top star everywhere, also, you know, other promoters uh, respected his opinions. He had retired from the ring, and he was at that time working as a talent scout, as he phrased it, uh, basically a contact uh, person for Vince. And I remember because Dennis Condor used to love when I would do that because Ernie said, have I ever lied to you? Have I ever lied to you, Jim Cornette? <laughs> no, Ernie, you never lied to us. I'm telling you, they're going to make more money up here than you've ever seen. <laughs> they're going to make a fucking fortune up here. Uh, Vince McMahon is, has had me contacting some people. He's interested in talking to the Midnight Express and Jim Cornette. Well, Ernie, I said, you know, we're, we were doing so well because that 86 was our biggest year with Crockett or TBS for that matter. By the time we, you know, finished getting paid on all those contracts, we were the world champions. We're working with the Rock and Roll Express. Houses are selling out. We don't want to get heat by talking to Vince because you can't keep a secret in the wrestling business, right? So we don't want to get heat by, you know, them hearing that we're talking to Vince McMahon when we're in this spot. And Ernie said, leave it up to me. I'll take care of it. I'll make all the arrangements. I'll figure it out. I'll get back to you, right? Okay. Because he had mentioned you can make $150,000, $200,000 a year. You can get a $25,000 signing bonus he's given to some people. See, this is what was getting our attention. Was the And I believe the amount of money per year, but this all twenty five grand in one fell swoop. You know, that was in 1986. So what's that fucking... Uh, of uh, 60 grand today, probably. Yeah. So I told the boys and I said, what the fuck should we go and talk that? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So as it evolves, I talked to Ernie a time or two again, and we set it up to where on like the one day off we have that month, uh, where we don't have to be at a show or whatever. And we're in town the night before, cause Charlotte's an airport hub. We're going to fly from Charlotte to New York. They're going to pick us up and take us to a hotel, not to the WWF office in Stanford where people would see us, but to a hotel, and Vince is going to meet us there. And at that point, we figured, well, all this stuff that Ernie's talking about, because, you know, he, he, he obviously praised Bobby and Dennis as a team because he'd worked with us in Louisiana, and I'd managed him. He'd worked six-mans, et cetera. Um, 
you know, and the money he's throwing around. So we figure he's going to tell us something about, you know, hey, we, we love your guys' work. We, you know, we would like to figure you into our championship picture. Or Ernie has mentioned we're giving out signing bonuses or anything, right? But that's not how Vince fucking. Now I know it's not how Vince works. But what happened? They take us to the hotel, nice hotel in Stanford, check us in. Uh, we're in the room. We wait for Vince. Here comes Vince. And we have the meeting. And as I recounted in the book, he basically spent a lot of the time talking about this was the new line of, of action figures, but they didn't call them action figures then. They called them dolls. We have a line of dolls that are just starting to come out that is going to be so successful. And we're thinking we're, we're heels. Who, who, why would we want people to buy dolls of us? This does not compute, right? And we didn't know there was going to be $80,000 checks over fucking dolls. But nevertheless... Um, he, he mentioned that, uh, well, we, you know, cause he looked at Bobby and Dennis cause they both had gigs on their heads and he said, we don't do that up here anymore. And that was like, you know, <laughs> what the fuck? It's, it's, it's not preferable that we cut our heads, but how do you get any heat? Right. We're thinking, holy shit. And we'd seen the kind of the TV show. We didn't do eight minute matches. And we, you know, we just, we were getting over with a completely different style in a completely different place. It was drawing big money and he didn't offer us any money. That was the main point of the whole talk. He gave us the opportunity to make more money, which is a big line with Vince to make more money that you've ever made. Trust me. Uh, but didn't talk about how much we might make, who we might work with. Are we in the title picture? You've got a bunch of teams up here. Who do you say, you know, how would you handle us? We're obviously going to be heels, blah, 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 nothing. And I'm thinking I now i got to compete with not only Bobby Heenan, because right now I'm pretty good. JJ's in the office and I'm the, I'm the pretty much the loudmouth manager and, and I, you know, I'm in a good spot, but now it's, I'd be competing with Bobby Heenan, Jimmy Hart and six other managers for TV time. And so, and then he took us to the hotel restaurant and bought us lunch. And then he got into a car that I swear to God, John Steed in a 1967 episode of the Avenger should have been driving <laughs> open air, fucking like thirties Bentley or whatever the fuck and fucking drives off out of the parking lot. And we're like, there was, he didn't offer us a signing bonus. He didn't, besides the opportunity to make more money than ever, there was no figures mentioned. Dolls were heavily figured in. And, you know, we admire your guy. Now I later know he'd never seen us before. He was relying on Ernie to say these guys are a great tag team, just like it's because he was very broad in his praise. I've heard a lot of great things about you, but never, boy, that match, I found out later, of course, he doesn't watch anything. Uh, he never sees anybody beforehand. So, it, you know, it was, it, Vince was collecting, uh, the, all the top talent at that point that he could and Ernie's making suggestions. So he was trying to follow through on it, but I, he didn't specifically want us as much as he wanted a team that was drawing that much money for the other guys or just to have us right in one place. We ended up prospering, uh, staying where we were because we were making great money and the schedule, even though it was horrible for Crockett, it was even worse in those days for the WWF. That's why the guys were all on various forms of shit. And, and also it was just, it was the style that we were both of us as a, as a tag team and as a manager were able to get over better. They didn't want guys to have real heat and have people fucking grabbing them out of the crowd in the WWF at that point. So I would have had a, a tool taken out of my toolkit. So we made the right decision and Vince didn't, didn't miss us because they did very well. <laughs> And I don't know that the, the the Midnight Express versus Demolition in front of the 86 WWF audience would not have nearly gotten over, nor would we have looked as good coming out of it as the Midnight Express and the Road Warriors did in the 86 NWA audience. No, I think the dream is more Midnight Express Bulldogs. That's the one I'm, I wish we could have had. Um you know, and, and, and then I saw, I just realized the other day I saw it on the internet. So it must be true. No, the footage was on there that they actually, that show that they promoted in Kansas city when all Japan came over oh, yeah. and co-promoted it, they had a rock and roll bulldogs match 
when the rock and roll was was on an out period with uh, the NWA that year, and and that that's cool. I envy those guys because I would have liked to have yes. I would like to have had probably of all the modern tag teams, the Midnight Express and the Bulldogs in their day, except I would have rather had the the Stampede Bulldogs when they were honestly realistic size and could really go rather than when they were blown up with air hoses, WWF Bulldogs. If we're going to get the whole Dynamite Kid experience, let's go when he can still move well. What about Midnight versus the Hart Foundation who would turn babyface, you know, by 1988? Yeah, and and th- and th- that would have been good also. As, and as, of course, we knew Neidhart from Mid South, but once again, to be honest, you know, there was Neidhart was not a dream opponent. He was just on the team. I'd like to have seen both Bobby and Dennis and Bobby and Stan later on against Bret Hart. After this period of time, of course, you leave WCW at the end of ninety. There are always those rumors that Ric Flair tried to get you in as the Kentucky Colonel to be his manager in 91, but be, oh God. beyond well, that, no, though... It, but, but wait a minute. Well, well, let's... Should we clarify that rumor now? Yeah. Um, because now I saw somebody legitimately wrote that on uh, some profile on the internet. What happened... Well, it, it, it was conversation between me and Rick, and I told a story one time, but people took it way too seriously. He actually, as you know, uh, I had been talking to him when I was trying to set up Smoky Mountain when he left WCW because I, Rick Rubin had said, if you could get Flair once a month to headline Knoxville, we'll pay him ten grand a fucking show, right? Well, there's one hundred twenty thousand dollars work one day a month if if he wanted to go to Japan and get a deal of some kind instead of going to work full-time for Vince, you know, whatever the fuck, right? <laughs> but of course, Rick wanted to be on TV and be on the road. Uh, but he calls me and says, hey, why don't you come up here with me and be the, the colonel, be my manager, the fucking colonel? And I said, no, I can't, I've got to do this. If you can't come to Knoxville, I can't come there, blah, 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 whatever. But I told that story in, with the laughing in my voice. Yes, if I had said, Rick, I would like to come and be the colonel and be your manager, he would have gone to Vince and said, hey, can Cornette come and be my manager, the colonel? Well, I don't know what Vince would have said from there, uh, but uh, but I didn't really pursue that and didn't ask him, and he didn't ask, and it was just us fucking with each other. And, of course, you revealed on one of the shows a few months back that Dusty had approached you when he returned to Crockett or I shouldn't say Crockett, when he returned to WCW at the beginning of 1991 to be the booker, and you explained why that wouldn't work out, specifically Jim Hurd. Wait a minute, wait a minute, phrase phrase that better. When when Dusty approached me to be the booker, Dusty approached me when he returned to be the booker. Dusty was the booker. Yes, excuse (laughs) me, excuse me, yes. yes. (laughs) You you, you left your participle dangling, Brian. Um, But yeah, and I just, I didn't want to be around Hurd, and I was setting up Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and I didn't... uh, you know, want to tell him that because I didn't, you know, want it out yet. So I, I blamed the LPWA. I said, they've been nice to the ladies professional wrestling. I, Pettacino had me going out doing their TV tapings when they had syndicated TV uh, once a month, the announcing with him, which was uh, fun and nice. And I liked Torberg and they paid me well and the girls were all friendly and everything. But I used that as the excuse. I said, I'll come back here if I can do this and that. And Dusty's like, I, I don't think that you do that kid. Oh, shucks. I'm sorry. But, be- uh, but no, I didn't want to deal with fucking Hurd, and I didn't want to tell him about Smoky Mountain. But beyond those, and I know that's not the WWF, did WWF or anyone there, because you knew J.J., he was in the office, you knew the artful Dodger Bruce Pritchard, who was working there. Before you go in in 93, at any other point, does anyone ever approach you about you uh, or you and the Express doing something? No, between uh, between 86 and, and uh, oh, I, I got to finish that story, but between 86 and 93, no, because I, I was either always under contract or it was, you know, in 91, I was, it was obvious I was not playing well with others. So (laughs) they probably probably were sitting around waiting to see what the fuck is he going to do next. And I, and, and then, and then actually I went back to uh, WCW briefly while Watts was there before I actually started with the WWF. So, but Oh, the, the fucking, Punchline to the fucking story is we decided, no, we're here. We're going to stay where we are because once again, you know, all of us had come from Tennessee. I've only been in the business f- not even four fucking years, and I'm going to make $200,000 a year being the top fucking manager of the World Tag Team Champions, and I'm going to – working with our friends, living in Charlotte, and I'm going to change this 
and go do WWF wrestling? No. And the the boys were not sufficiently convinced. And there's been a story out there that Dennis, and actually Dennis may have put one to put the story out here, but it wasn't true that Dennis left in 87 because we turned down the offer. That was not it. And once again, uh, we all know, all of us in the Midnight Express know what the reason was. Nobody else needs to, but everybody loves everybody now. Anyway, um, so we take this secret trip. We go back immediately to the airport from the hotel and fly back the same day. The big secret trip, right? But it, we got to Charlotte that morning to fly up there to the airport. And at our gate is fucking Tully Blanchard's best friend that worked for fucking U.S. Air. <laughs> Looking at us on a day that he knows is off because he'd probably be that evening riding with Tully if we were in Gaffney, South Carolina or something. He'd be in Tully's car. And we were boarding the flight to New York. <laughs> so <laughs> I was. I think it was the following week that Crockett, instead of the existing contracts that we were on, which actually didn't guarantee us anything, the first contracts we signed with Jim Crockett were the standard wrestling contracts and didn't really have a guarantee. But the next week he had our, our new three-year contracts for what we later negotiated to be guarantees of a hundred, 125 and $150,000 a year. And we made more than that in all of those years ended up, but we had new contracts the following week. So offered to us that we didn't ask for. (laughs) (laughs) So it all worked out well in the end, I guess. One of my favorite things about when you finally went in in 93 was like you said, everyone kind of knew by this point that you didn't play well with others. And a few months earlier, maybe the end of 92 is when Lawler debuted and Dave Meltzer and the Observer wrote, hell froze over this week, Jerry Lawler is in the WWF. And then when you debuted in the summer of 93, he was like, I think the headline was, or the first line was, hell froze over again this week as Jim (laughs) Cornette. So hell kept freezing over because of you Memphis people in 1993. But but once again, here's the thing. And... uh, I think we went back to something I just said. I'd rather have somebody I can fucking trust. At that point, the WWF needed talent, different talent. Even though WCW was still not doing real good business, WWF had been in a slump, and Vince had the steroid trial going. And obviously, Jerry Jarrett had been brought up in what fall of 92, or right before Lawler, basically. You can track when Jarrett showed up, but when Lawler got there, um, because if Vince went to jail, they, they were going to have somebody that was able to kind of steer the ship and keep the fucking company running because it wasn't as, it obviously wasn't a publicly traded company then. And it wasn't as big as it is now. And it was basically the McMahon family and whoever they deemed to be in charge of creative and the office. And Jerry Jarrett was probably going to be a little bit of both. Um, Lawler comes up because Jarrett can trust Lawler. They're partners. None of them are going to do business with WCW, right? Um, anybody else that, that Jarrett had a hand in bringing in or that any of the, any of the, they brought in after that, Bruce is the one who called me. Uh, We've told the story about me sending that joke promo up because I was managing his brother. But the point is, here's another guy. They know that Jim Cornette is not going to do business with WCW because I just had. And I left because Watts was gone. So so I'm not going to be doing business with WCW. I'm running a company. If they can help me, then I can funnel them talent. The guys that I manage, my top tag team, who are excellent performers, one of them is Bruce's brother, and the other one is, is Jimmy Del Rey, who has just gotten his break. So they're, they're, they're starting to contact people that they can – trust are not going to work for or with uh, the opposition or undermine them and or can funnel talent to them because jared had a whole territory also that was you know early steps in that direction 